It was supposed to be just six days. A Caribbean adventure of surfing and fun in the sun. But Daryl Fornatura never came home. What was going through your mind at that point? Something's really wrong. Daryl's family would suddenly embark on a desperate quest to find him or answers. But will they ever find either? I was lied to by so many people that my conclusion was that something bad happened to Daryl and, and they're covering it up. Tennis pro Daryl Fornatura already lived in a virtual paradise, Palm Beach, Florida, where he had a booming business and a family who idolized him. What should we know about your son? He was funny and adventurous. Oh, God, he was just so loving. Daryl had a, uh, a warm personality. He was not the totally gregarious type that would make a lot of noise, but he had a warmth to him that just kind of flowed naturally with people. The 45-year-old divorced bachelor liked to work hard and play hard, too. He just lived life big. That's how he was. Um, he loved to surf. He, I mean, he worked to surf. It was his passion. He loved it. Women surf and food. And that, that's pretty much what made him tick. Um, and in that order. <laughs> Daryl had a like-minded friend in local harbor pilot, Matt Rigby. Tell me about Matt Rigby. Who is he to you and the family? He's a good friend of my brother's. They've known each other um, at the time of the trip about six years. They went on surf trips together. Eager to blow off some steam, Matt and Daryl planned their latest adventure, a six-day surfing trip to Cabarete, a small fishing town on the north coast of the Dominican Republic. He came to dinner on Sunday night as normal, and we were talking, and he said to me, Mom, this trip, you don't have to worry about me because the Dominican Republic is just like being in the States. And my phone, I can use it just like I would uh, if I were here. But like many mothers, Nancy worries anyway. So that very Monday, as Daryl travels with Matt, he stays in close touch. He texted me when he was at the airport. He texted me when he left security. And he texted me when he got to Cabarete. And then he knew that I'd want to know that he was uh, arriving safely in uh, Puerto Plata. So he just texted, I'm here. He took the time because he always wanted you to feel at ease. Correct. He did that for you. He did that for me. When Daryl and Matt land in Puerto Plata, they rent a car and drive to their rented villa at the Perla Marina, 10 minutes outside the town of Cabarete. For the next 24 hours, Daryl keeps his mom in the loop about his adventures. What was the last communication you had with him? What day, what time? It was Tuesday, the 26th at 6.28 p.m. He texted that he'd had an epic day in the water, five hours water time. He was exhausted and ready to crash. Love you, call you tomorrow. But Wednesday comes and goes with no communication from Daryl. I thought, I'm not going to be a worry wart mother. He's a grown man. On Thursday, when he hadn't communicated with me, I was really getting very nervous. Then on Friday, Daryl's family receives a call that turns their lives upside down. About 8.30 in the morning, uh, I get a call, and he said it's Matt Rigby, and uh, he's calling to let us know that uh, Daryl was missing. Matt Rigby told him that he hadn't seen Daryl since the 27th. According to Matt, on Wednesday, Daryl leaves on a surf scout to the nearby town of Sasua with a local man named Gaspar. Daryl and Matt had rented surfboards from Gaspar the day before. Hours later, Daryl allegedly returns to the villa acting extremely paranoid. Daryl was behaving strangely, saying he wanted to get out of there, let's fly home, let's go. And Matt said, no, you're fine, you're just, I don't know what you're being paranoid about, let's go shopping in downtown Cabarete, we'll get you about to eat, it'll all be fine. 
Once in town, Matt decides to slip into this local surf shop to buy souvenirs. Daryl doesn't go in the shop with him, and when he comes out, Daryl's gone. He said he couldn't find him, and he looked around the stores and looked up and down the beach, and he looked all over. Over five hours, I searched. I searched everywhere. I said I went up the beach, back the beach, in the town, all over the town, looking for Daryl, and I couldn't find him. And when Daryl's worried father asks about the status of the search, Matt surprises him with his current location. He was at Daryl's place of work, and he was calling from there because uh, he didn't have our telephone number. He was looking for our home phone number and Daryl's personal belongings at his place of work. Daryl's family is shocked. Just two days after his friend goes missing, Matt is back in the States in Daryl's Palm Beach office. That right away struck a strange chord with me because all you have to do is Google us and he knew where we lived, he had been there. Did he call police or the embassy? Did he call for help at all besides heading back to the States? As far as we know, absolutely not. Um, he never called any of the local police. He didn't call the embassy. He kept saying we needed to do that. He didn't do anything. A Caribbean surfing vacation becomes a journey to hell. Daryl Fornatura has headed to the Dominican Republic with his buddy, Matt Rigby. But just two days in, Daryl is nowhere to be found. The Carib Surf Shop is the last place Matt Rigby says he saw Daryl alive. He told his parents they were shopping and he just simply vanished. Matt allegedly claims Daryl was acting paranoid and afraid for his safety. But Matt never reports Daryl missing to Dominican authorities. And two days later, he returns home to the U.S. with bizarre news for Daryl's family. At some point in that day, he uh, tells us about um, a search and rescue person, a man named Leon Alter. Leon Alter is a Canadian expat and founder of Crime Stoppers. And Matt somehow knows he's the man to call for help. In fact, Matt immediately returns to the Dominican Republic with his wife, Paulina, plus $5,000, presumably to pay Alter. Alter posts pleas for tips about Daryl on social media and allegedly dispatches search crews. What did the U.S. Embassy say about him when you inquired? They said he's some guy that does search and rescue. They were really not clear on um, who he was or how he operated either. Um, they just knew that he was involved in and could offer information, help us with information. Frustrated by a lack of results from Alter and a lack of action from the U.S. Embassy and Dominican police, Christina and her husband decide to fly down to search for Daryl themselves. My brother and I had a very special relationship. We lived very different lifestyles, but we were so close and we talked all the time and it was, I got your back no matter what. And that's the way I feel now. I owe it to him. That's my mission. He wouldn't stop till he found answers for me and I can't stop till I find them for him. Christina makes arrangements with Matt Rigby to join forces when they arrive. But in another strange twist, that doesn't happen. When we landed in Santo Domingo on February 2nd, I texted him and he said, uh, my wife and I flew back last night. And that was, that was it. Wow. What was going through your mind at that point? Something's really wrong. Christina and her husband find a lot wrong in Cabarete, discovering a sleazy and corrupt underworld right out of a paperback novel. It is isolated, and it is very much the wild, wild west up there. The countless stories we heard of tourists being drugged, their drinks being drugged, marijuana being laced, set up with prostitutes, set up by driving, being stopped on the road by police and, you know, give me a thousand dollars or you're under arrest. And interestingly, when we uncovered all of these stories, the common theme for those that are targeted 
single Western males. For Christina and her husband, the local police become more of a hindrance than any help. Were you allowed to roam freely? No, um, we had an escort at all times. It was sold to us as for our protection, but I, I believe it was just as much to know what we were doing as it was to keep us safe. Is this a cover up to you for their reputation, for the tourism? What do you make of this? Absolutely. From, from the get-go, the biggest obstacle that we have encountered is keeping his missing posters up. Um, we would put them up, they would be torn down. Christina returns home utterly discouraged. With zero faith in Dominican law enforcement, Daryl's family doubles down on the help of self-proclaimed crime stopper Leon Alter. And that help came with money? Um, over time, yes, that is correct. We did make as much as $13,000 in donations. What did he bring to you? What information did he gather? That is a good question. It doesn't take long before Leon Alter himself raises even more suspicions. Do you think sure. Leon at all was helping your family in any way? Well, I thought he was in the beginning, yeah. And, uh... He's the one that uh, organized the search in the beginning, so, so he says. I mean, I wasn't there. The one thing that still is inexplicable is uh, he's a, the one that does all of the uh, security cameras in downtown Caporetti. So it just so happens that the time when Darrell went missing, those exact times, those tapes weren't available. They weren't recording. And Leon, is he legit in your mind or no? I don't know the answer to that. You feel you were misguided by this man? Yes. Fed up with what they perceived as a labyrinth of lies, the Fornitura family hires private investigators from the United States. Among them, Michael Suravolo and Richard Pimentel of Bo Deedle and Associates. The Fornitura family hired us because they didn't have a whole lot of confidence in the local police. A retired New York police detective and a native of the Dominican Republic, Pimentel travels back to the exotic island to shake the trees. I interviewed many people during my stay in the Dominican Republic and I have a feeling that they're, they're all covering up for something. That's my feeling. Weeks have passed since the mysterious disappearance of Daryl Fornatora in the Dominican Republic, and his family grows desperate for answers. All we need is the crumb. Someone saw something, someone knows something. But between Daryl's evasive travel buddy, Matt Rigby, the tangled red tape of Dominican law enforcement, and the fruitless actions of a mercenary crime stopper, Daryl's family soon takes things to the next level. You've done a lot to try and gather information on your own, private investigators. We had uh, three different private investigators. Among these investigators is Richard Pimentel, a Dominican native who travels to Cabarete to look into Daryl's disappearance, and what he learns is eye-opening. The strip of restaurants and bars alongside the beach where Daryl disappeared, it's heavy prostitution at night. That's where you go and buy drugs in Cabaret sometimes. And a lot of those restaurants are owned by people connected with the mob or some kind of organized crime from Italy. And I believe that the, the police force does security for a lot of these establishments on the beach. So they're all intertwined in that whole world. Navigating the seedy streets of Cabarete, Pimentel is able to track down a promising lead. The last known person to talk to Daryl outside the same surf shop where Matt Rigby says he last saw his friend. I found a witness, a Canadian national. Her name is Jacqueline Beck. She said that she was walking into town and she saw Daryl and Matt walking in front of her. And she noticed that Daryl was acting irrational. And then when Matt went in the store, Daryl approached her and said, was asking her for help. 
He said, I need to leave this country. He was paranoid, said, asking if there were any gangs in the in cabaret, if there were any mobs. She asked him if he had consumed marijuana. He said yes. And then uh, Daryl kind of panicked a little bit because a couple of kids approached her, the locals, and he backed off from her and then just left. Jacqueline Beck's statement backs up Matt Rigby's claim about Daryl's state of mind prior to his disappearance. But what or who could cause him such extreme paranoia? Enter Emilio Gaspar, the local who rents out surfboards and took Daryl to nearby Playa Sasua in the hours before he started acting paranoid. According to Gaspar, he wanted to show Daryl a, a good surfing spot. But I'm from the area, I know the, the spot that he mentioned was a regular beach where there's no surfing taking place in Sosua. So he's lying right there that he was showing Daryl a good surfing spot. He's a very shady character. He's what we call a player. I believe he deals drugs. He facilitates drugs and, and, and prostitutes. If you're looking to buy some drugs, Sosua would be a good place to go. When he went to Sosua, he could have purchased something that was laced with a drug and just been a victim that way and then, you know, easy prey to someone who wanted to rob him or drag him off somewhere. Was the marijuana Daryl admitted to smoking laced with something that made him fear people were after him? Whatever the answer, one fact remains. Daryl did disappear. His paranoia may have been founded, which begs the question, what happened in Sasua? I think Daryl might have rubbed someone the wrong way there over uh, maybe a drug deal, purchasing some recreational drugs, or maybe hooking up with a, a local prostitute. Could his trusted guide, Gaspar, have had a hand in Daryl's fate? It's possible is possible because he he I wouldn't put it past him he 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 could be the type of person that could get involved in, in, in something like that if Gaspar knows anything he's not talking no one is and just like Daryl's sister Christina Pimentel suspect local police are actually working against the cause I met a person that he was kind of giving me information on what was going on. And that person was picked up by the police and was told, I believe you've been talking to a detective from the United States. You have to remember that you live here, your family's here, and you're the only one that can get in trouble. So, you know, you should be careful what you do. And then he, they let him go. He called me in a panic. So why would they do that? You know what I mean? Something's going on, and we can't get to the bottom of it because of the police involvement. Pimentel finally does meet with the local officer in charge of the case and receives some shocking news. I wanted to compare no notes and talk to him, and he just cut me off. He said, oh, that case is closed. We have two witnesses that saw him go in the water and never come out. He drowned. That case is closed. According to Dominican police, witnesses on Cabarete Beach claim they saw Daryl wade into the water and not come out. But Pimentel says no way. I don't believe that he drowned because uh, of the circumstances and the stories that I heard doesn't add up to drowning. And he was an athlete, a professional surfer. Where he supposedly drowned was that the regular beach was four feet deep. Christina doesn't buy it either. Is your brother a good swimmer? He's an excellent swimmer. He grew up in the water. That was his life. <laughs> Surfing in the water were his life. During her next visit to the Dominican Republic, Christina meets with one of the witnesses to Daryl's so-called drowning. I said, we've been told that you said you saw him swim out and never come back. And he's like, no, I saw he went up to his chest and he was in the water and that was it. And then I didn't pay attention to what he did after that. The family says this kind of account shouldn't be enough to call the case closed. The national police 
were the ones who were saying that, oh, you know, it looks like it's a drowning, moving on. They were just very quick to rule it an accidental drowning, so they yes. just don't want this pinned on their reputation. That is correct. It, it impacts tourism. They do not like that. That is a barrier that we have absolutely come up against. But there's another undeniable matter. Everybody tells me that whenever somebody drowns, no matter how long it takes, the ocean you know, tends to spit the body out. And that never happened with that. In mid-March, a Florida news reporter calls the drowning into question. Then almost two months after Daryl went missing, something incredible happens. His broadcast aired on, I believe it was March 15th. The next day after that piece aired, Daryl's wallet washes ashore. Daryl's wallet still contains his credit cards, ID, and $462 in cash. Literally a, a local kind of druggy bomb that lives on the beach found it. The um, same beach where he supposedly allegedly drowned. Correct. Where the wallet washes ashore is maybe 100 meters down the beach from where he supposedly swam into the water seven weeks prior. So in seven weeks, the wallet went out, supposedly in the shorts my brother was wearing, which he doesn't generally take his wallet into the water with him, and then washes back in the same spot seven weeks later. And a wallet with hundreds of dollars in it, still intact when it was found. That is correct. And I can tell you, no one would not keep that money. Why was that wallet turned in? That's not normal behavior for how it works down it there. Pimentel agrees. Daryl's wallet washing ashore does nothing but raise further suspicions about a local conspiracy. I was lied to by the police. I was lied to by some witnesses. I was lied to by so many people that my conclusion was that something bad happened to Daryl and, and they're covering it up. Everybody, for some reason, is very scared to talk. And that everybody seems to include Daryl's friend and travel partner, Matt Rigby. Months after his disappearance, Daryl Fornatorna's family is still no closer to finding answers. He was a wonderful, warm, caring, loving son. And I'm... I miss that every single day. Is there a thought in your mind that maybe he's alive? No. With all the roadblocks the investigation has hit, one person seems to hold the key, Daryl's travel partner, Matt Rigby. But Matt has been shockingly elusive. After he didn't join Christina and her husband during their initial visit to the island, Christina did manage to get him on the phone called him um, to kind of say, you know, what in the world happened? I thought we were going to meet. Why did you leave? And it, he really never had a clear answer. Was this also the same call where he breaks down in tears? He actually broke down crying and was saying, I can't believe this is happening. Um, and he actually said, no more surf trips for Maddie. My wife is never going to let me go on a surf trip again. And that's what his tears were for. And shortly afterwards, he ended up hiring a criminal defense attorney? That's correct. Since then, the Fornatura family says it's been mostly radio silence from Matt Rigby's camp. Is he being quiet because he's cowering or because he was involved? I don't know that you can keep as quiet as he is kept just because you saw something bad happen. And as Christina looks into Matt's actions in the days after Daryl's disappearance, deeper suspicions take root. When Matt left the Dominican Republic, he takes my brother's surfboard, his laptop computer, his digital camera, his GoPro camera, and a lot of his um, clothes as well. Even his clothes. Exactly, it made no sense at all. Matt eventually gave those items back to the family. But once Christina takes possession of Daryl's laptop, she finds what she believes are a suspect series of emails 
sent by Matt throughout the 48 hours after Daryl vanished. On the face of it, that doesn't seem so odd, but you're on vacation with your buddy. You both have cell phones. Why are you sending an email? In the bulk of those emails, Matt is updating his MIA buddy on his whereabouts and asking him to get in touch. In one message, Matt attaches an enticing photo of himself and some babes at a bar, allegedly awaiting Daryl's arrival. The embassy did timestamps on the emails. And um, one of the emails, he says, you know, I'm, I'm going to catch a flight in a couple of hours. I'm getting ready to leave the villa. When he sends that email, he's sitting in the airport in Puerto Plata. Christina also doesn't buy the handwritten note Matt allegedly left at the villa, letting Daryl know he was flying back to the States, asking where he went and if he was safe. What are you feeling when you're reading through all of that? Anger. I, I mean, there's, there's raw, unadulterated anger. He knows what happened to my brother. In another odd twist, Matt returned the rental car before he flew out even though he allegedly thought Daryl was still somewhere on the island. Matt's timeline for that also gives Christina pause. We know he returned that rental car at 1230 to the airport in Puerto Plata. He tells us and has told us repeatedly that he was on his way to the airport at about nine o'clock. So there's about three hours of time that is unaccounted for. He says he just went straight to the airport. He didn't do anything. There's about 100 miles missing, unaccounted for, that that car traveled. Christina later learned that Matt's suspect behavior didn't end there that day. My husband and I traveled back to the Dominican Republic to meet with the embassy, and um, one of those agents said, we got the airport footage of Matt on camera at the airport. He actually goes into a bathroom changes clothes completely, like shirt, pants, shoes, even his baseball cap. And the agents told us he was behaving very, very strangely. I did not see that with my own eyes. Um, so it's a second count story from the agents who did see it. The question is, why did Matt Rigby put extra mileage on the car? Why did he fly home only to immediately return to the Dominican Republic with $5,000? All of those things that he did were done with a purpose, a specific purpose. Stuart Kaplan, the third private investigator hired by Daryl's family, floats a theory. There has been some rumors and some conjecture as to whether or not Daryl was being held against his will and whether or not a ransom was required to have been paid. Um, one of the theories is whether or not Matt returned to the United States to retrieve cash to return to the Dominican Republic, uh, only to find that unfortunately Daryl had already been murdered. Was Matt strong-armed by some bad operators? He certainly had plenty of chances to explain himself. There was an agent um, at, from the embassy who was going to meet with Matt per our request and Matt agreed. They had a date scheduled, they had the interview scheduled, the agent flew into Miami and as soon as he landed got a text saying, um, can't do it, sorry, talk to my lawyer. But Rigby says he has provided information. Four months after Daryl's disappearance, Rigby's then criminal lawyer told a national magazine Rigby had spoken to the FBI and a representative from the U.S. Department of State and that his client is not withholding anything. Crime Watch Daily traveled to Palm Beach, Florida to ask Matt Rigby for ourselves. Two places are registered to Matt Rigby, including the apartment building over my shoulder. It's about five minutes away from his workplace. We think he's home. We're going to go door knock and hope he'll talk to us. Hi, Matt. Hi, I'm Melissa with Crime Watch Daily, here to talk to you about your friend Daryl. Do you have a few minutes? No, I'm sorry. Matt, listen, the family has talked to us and they feel that you know more than you're leading on to. There's a lot of weighty accusations. I think you should address these on camera or in a statement. We want to let your voice be heard on this. You're going to want your voice to be heard on this. I just want to be fair. I don't, I don't want to leave without giving you a chance. Anything at all you could say? There's a lot of questions the family has for you. 
sir? He did not want to talk, and this was a fear for the family. They believe he knows what happened to their son, and it's clear he's going to remain silent. What is most frustrating? Matt not being forthcoming with the information that we feel he must have is probably the worst part. Well, on the best day, Matt is a complete coward and the worst friend in the history of friends and did something or didn't do something that contributed to Daryl being killed. Daryl Fornitore's fate remains unresolved for now. I think that if the, if, if the United States Embassy pressures the police department, I'm sure that somebody's gonna speak and this case could be solved. But unless that happens, you know, we have to just rely on luck and and time. The Dominican Republic is a pass-through country with respect to the importation of drugs into the United States. Um, it will be just a matter of time to whether it's the FBI, the DEA, the U.S. Embassy comes into contact with a specific individual who has the right information to be able to connect the dots as to exactly what happened to Daryl Fornatoro. In the meantime, Daryl's family must live with the pain of his absence. My husband's deployed currently, and, and my kids miss their uncle because he was always the one that during these difficult times, during deployments, would step in and be that father figure. Um, and they don't have that now, and it's hard. It's very painful. In honor of him, we've got to do something to find answers for him because this should never have ha happened. And. Uh, we, 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 we need to get answers. Not having his phone call every morning, not having his hugs, that's the hard part, just not knowing what happened. Without closure, it is like living that first day over every day for my parents, um, for my family, for all of us. We did talk on the phone with Leon Alter, the mercenary crime stopper, who told us he believes Daryl drowned. But then again, quote, for all I know, he might turn up somewhere in Mexico 10 years from now. We requested an on-camera interview, but he told us he couldn't do one because he's a, quote, agent of Interpol, something we've not been able to confirm.